for for guys that obviously feel that you know doing extras is is all that they have to do that's also not the truth because you can you can over um work yourself you can you can you know sometimes the brain is 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 a powerful thing and overthinking things um wanting to do x y and z you know you, you know you just have to strip it back again like i said and make sure you just do little bits at a time little bits at a time and um, eventually you know it all comes together Welcome to Leave No Doubt, Nathan Dyer. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure, pleasure. How are you doing? All good? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Yourself? Uh, very well, thank you. Uh, listen, to get us started, mate, you were part of an incredibly successful Southampton Academy um, during a period of time of, of where so many of you were graduating from the youth team to the first team. What was it that you were doing so well at the time um, that meant you made that step up with so much success? Um, to be honest with you, looking back now, um a lot of it was just having fun. Um, from such an early age, my mum and dad just let me have fun. They never told me anything about, you know, the stresses of, you know, playing or um, when managers or coaches had said something to them, you know, they'd never relay it back to me. So I just had fun, really. Um, and then it was a whole new experience when I did eventually move to Southampton and um, I started, you know, my journey. It was a new experience for me. So... Sorry, this keeps going in and out. Just... I think if if you if you pull it a little bit closer to you. Hello. Is that a bit better? Yeah. Sorry. I think it's, yeah, when the microphone's a little bit closer to you, that's that's a bit better. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. that's okay. There we are. Sorry. Yeah, that's cool. Um Yeah, so what was it that you were doing so well at the time that made meant you you know you made that step up with so much success? Um I think it was just enjoyment. Just loving the game. Obviously, you know, as a young kid, all you want to do is play football, you know, with your mates um, on the streets or in the, in the garden. So that's all I wanted to ever do, I think. And then eventually when I went to Southampton, um, it was a whole new experience for me moving away from home, um, being with the boys that I've grown up with from, you know, I was seven. So a lot of them were with me from that, that age. And um, and yeah, I was just, just enjoying every day, really. Just, just going out there and just wanting to, just kick a football around um you know i never put anything stressful on my, upon myself or um nobody put anything you know on me so that was probably about it really when did at what age did it start to become a little bit more serious um it's hard to say i'm i'm, a, I'm not really a serious guy <laughs> so i like to you know have jokes have fun and um i have been told that a few times you know i was going to get released because I was my concentration wasn't there um not when I was playing but just you know in training or when you know coaches and managers were listening uh, talking to us um I'd always be goofing around messing about so um you know it was just it was just one of those things that I had to to hone in for me um but yeah it didn't get serious till I was a lot older to be honest with you even when I made my debut um you know it was just it was just excitement more than anything so to try and get an insight into, you know, Southampton Academy during that time, because you were one of an incredible amount of successful guys, really. And some of those guys have obviously gone on to, to win to, to win awards in, and, you know, Champions Leagues and, and things like that. So what was it about Southampton during that period of time that created so many players? What was going on? Um, they created a family. So it was a family vibe. Um, when I left school, we moved into a place called The Lodge, which is basically it was a massive house so you had the first year and second year YTS we all lived together um so we were you know with each other every day we weren't with our um, families um our parents wherever they lived you know we were there constantly every day um you know we had together you know shared rooms um everything was always together so it was kind of like you developed like a you know a friendship brother like a you know even a sibling kind of thing like a brother and um and I think that helped us on the pitch because, you know, we'd all help each other. It was never an individual situation where it was like, I'm not going to do that because, you know, I'm looking out for myself. You know, everybody was together and that's where I think that's how, um, you know, we went quite far um, as a group. So see, obviously in youth football at the moment, 
there's so many guys that are playing football and the opportunity to make it is really difficult. I think the, you know, the stats show it's something like 0.0 something percent of nine year olds end up in the first team of the academy that they're in. So when it's so difficult for youth players to make it in the first team, and so many of you guys did that, mm. what specifically was it about the coaching you were receiving, the football that you guys were playing? Mm. What actually allowed all of you to, you know, to make that step? Um, we had a we had a coach called um, George Prost, and he was a French guy. And that you know, all of the boys that were in my youth team at the time would always remember him, and he brought that technicality to you know football at a young age. So you know, it was never you know if in doubt, <laughs> you know, shell the ball down the pitch. It was you know make sure that you're you know you, you use your body and you learn the game properly. Um, learn how to pass, learn how to receive. Um, so we had that that type of training and. You know, we we passed the ball um, better than any teams. Even when we played Arsenal, you know, we used to to beat Arsenal a lot. So um, we were lucky, obviously, to have players that you know, were technically gifted and um, as well. So you know, when we all got together, it just all clicked. And what did that feel like? Obviously, because it a new football and now. You know, I've talked about it a little bit. It's almost really competitive in terms of guys are trying to get an opportunity off the back of somebody else and. And a lot of youth guys are, are competing with one another for the same contract. Mm. But it seemed, obviously, in that era of, of Southampton's Academy, a lot of you guys weren't competing with one another. You were almost working together and end up helping the first team off the back of that. Mm. What did that feel like how, how, when there sort of wasn't that competition? Um, well, I mean, going back to... I mean, in my when I was coming through, it's a lot different to now. I mean, my little boy plays football and I see you know the change of you know even parents i feel like the parents want their child to make it for them not for not for the child's um sake you know so it's it's a lot of um a lot of stress a lot of pressure um on on the younger boys now to to make sure that they make it or you know they do the right things you know i'm hearing you know 10 12 year olds on nutritional um food and you know making sure that they don't do this and do this and you know that was never the case with us it was you know obviously natural ability but again like I said it was just all of us being together um you know you, you always talk about in businesses everyone has bonding sessions and stuff we had that every day you know so it wasn't um too much of a problem with us we knew each other inside out therefore on the pitch it came out um but I mean as a younger boy um yeah again it was just wanted just to to go out and play and be the best and um and again enjoy it that was it so, I mean, you made your debut in the first team as a as a 17-year-old very successfully, I might add. Um, but say from the age of 16 after you leave school, like, can you give us an insight into what your academy lifestyle and, and what your football lifestyle was like at that point? How how often were you training and what were you doing um, that obviously allowed you to, to bridge that gap between school and first team so quickly? Yeah, I mean... Um... Again, I think it was a couple. It was a couple of months before I was finishing year eleven, and my mom and dad said, you know, they're about to, um, you know, let you know if you're going to have a contract or not. Which, you know, was a shock to me because I didn't. I just thought you just carried on playing. You know, that's what I was doing. So I didn't know that that was, you know, how it worked um, with the contract. So obviously, my mom and dad kept me away from, from all of that. Um, and then, you know, finishing school is, you know, bam, you're going to go and live down there. But before. We had like a Bath satellite training centre, which um, there was a few of the boys trained down there. Um, and then we all got together with the Southampton um, base boys and, you know, played the games down there. Um, so, yeah, so once that, that kind of, you know, happened, I just moved down into the lodge um, and it was just all system go, really. Training every day. I think it was a Monday and a Thursday that we had to go to college. Um say go to college now. <laughs> I don't think we've done much work but <laughs> we got told a lot of the uh, a lot of the answers but um you know that's what we had to do you know because obviously I think to be an academy you had to have some form of education so um got B tech sports or some some madness I don't know what was going on there um and then yeah it was just training and I think um you know then it was such a privilege to to train with the first team to say for instance there was an injury we'd be we we were in Marchwood was where they train at Southampton. Uh, the first team would be up the top and we'd be down the bottom. And um, if they had an injury or they needed an extra player, somebody would come down and call call one of us. And, you know, I remember when, every time the coach came down, everyone's like, oh, hoping it's me, hoping it's me. And obviously if somebody gets called that's in your position, 
you just you're raging oh yeah brilliant brilliant that's meant to be me kind of thing um so that was also you know that kind of kick up the bum and making sure that you're you're on it every day because everyone wanted to, to go and train with the first team you know um and be that person to get called up because you, you know you kind of felt on top of the world um and then yeah you know a few of us then eventually did train with the first team and you know just kind of kicked off from there for me I want to get into that a little bit more because obviously that competitive nature that you football is at the moment uh, and you're talking about if somebody goes up to the first team instead of you, obviously, you, you know, you're a little bit hurt by that. And if it's you for whatever reason, you, you must obviously have a, a positive feeling off the back of that. So if you're not picked mm. um, to go up there, what did that what did that do for you? Like, What, what did you do off the back of that feeling? Um, it was a lot of anger then, I think, um, from from anyone. Um, you know, if you if somebody gets somebody got called up ahead of them, and because we were training at the time still, so we trained earlier than the first team. So if you didn't get called up, and we're say playing a possession um, possession, or we're playing a game or something, you just see then you just see tackles flying in left, right, and center, um, and it, it did get heated a lot of the times, you know. But once we finished, you know, we were all friends again. But yeah, I think it was you know inside it hurt because you you wanted especially when you're playing the games, you know, with your, you know, under 17s or whatnot, and you're doing well, you're scoring goals or you're, 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 um, in the man of the, the moment, you know, you kind of feel that you deserve to be that one, but knowing what I know now in football, that's not the way it goes. But when you're younger, you just feel if I'm training well, playing well, then I should get those opportunities, which again is, is, is never always the case. So knowing what you know now, how would you have dealt with that situation if, if you had the knowledge that you do now? Um, I think, I would have um, done most of the same things for myself, which was, you know, again, just enjoy playing football because that was when I was at my best, when I just, I was free. Nobody, you know, when, when managers trying to pull me in and tell me what I can't do and what I can do, it's, you know, it's like I've got the shackles on. So for me, it was just letting me express myself, obviously saying, look, when, you know, you've got to do some kind of duties, defensive duties or whatnot. But other than that, you know, play your game. And that was always, you know, there for me just to make sure that I'd, express myself um but no one I know now would always be you know just being a bit more smart smarter with you know things I've done things I said you know I, I never knew that like managers would watch you warm up you know so even warming up um if you're not doing that properly you know they're watching that um you're not even treating people around the training ground if you're not you know treating people and um with respect you know that also plays a part so you know so many small little details that now I know that they do um, uh, look at, I think I'll do a few of those those things much better. But overall, you know, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a kind guy anyway. So um, it just came normal for me to be that way. And, um, and luckily enough, you know, I got, got the break that I, I, I felt I deserved. And so talk to me about the moment that if for whatever reason you were asked to go and train with the first team, how, how did that feel and what, what did that look like? Oh, that amazing. Amazing. You know, you get getting called because you, because they had like a, it was well at the time, not 23s, it was reserves that we used to play. So um, they used to train on the reserve pitch up the top. Um, and it looked like a little stadium. You had the bo advertising boards on the side and, you know, you were grown men, you know, so you felt, yeah, yeah, this is me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm flying. And obviously I think when I started to train, um, it was like Wayne Bridge was just about to move to Chelsea at the time. So, you know, there's a few, um, a few good players, you know, still playing. Um, that I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to play with. Um, but yeah, you felt on top of the world. You know, you couldn't wait to finish and go and call your mum and dad and say, oh, mum, I was training with first team today. Um, you know, because you felt that sense of um, the, your, the progression. You felt that you know, the managers were seeing your progression and felt that you deserved that kind of, you know, well done, son. And then it's keep going kind of thing, you know. And I think if you didn't get that call to go and train, you know, sometimes in the back of your head, you're kind of thinking, am I doing something wrong, you know. Um, but again, it's, it's, that's, that's, the, that's never the case. A lot of guys that I've spoken to, uh, obviously, like yourself, have played at the top level, talk about wanting more off the back of success. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you just said there that, you know, I've, I've been involved with the first team uh, and now I want that feeling again. Mm -hmm. What was it that, you know, that drove that feeling of, of ultimately, once you've been in the first team, quite a lot of guys, uh, you know, as you've probably seen in your career, can say, oh, that's enough. Like, I've, I've cracked it and take your foot off the gas. And, mm. um, and, and, you know, and the very successful guys like you manage to have a bit mm. and want more. Mm. What does that feeling look like? Um, see, a lot of people have, have, have different 
um, different ways. So mine was obviously, like I touched on before, was just um, express myself. I, I mean, I love football, you know, to the death. You know, I, that's all I wanted to do. Um, you know, I watched every game that was on. Um, played football manager. You know, that was that was me. Some people um, have the talent, but don't apply themselves as much as they should have done. And some people are a bit too professional. And we had a, a young kiddie at Southampton, um, a French boy, and he was very professional, dev into the letter, stretching, you know, hydration, nutrition, um, training, but ultimately didn't have quite enough of the, that talent to, to take him to the next level. Um, so, you know, it's not always, it's not always um, making sure that you, you know, you put 100% in everything um, because you still need to have that, you know, that little spark going forwards. But for me, when I made, eventually when I made my debut at 17, um, you know, it was, it was a dream come true. Uh, but to be fair, there was a few of us. It was in the cup um, and we all got called up. So I think I was still, yeah, I was still obviously with, uh, I was 17, so I was still with the under-17s, um, but playing really well and I was scoring. Um, so when I got called up, it was um, excitement again. You know, I, I never really put pressure on myself. Um, and when I do, things always go go wrong. So I just kind of, you know, take it as it comes and 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 do the best I can do. How did you ultimately realise that, as you're speaking about there, that putting pressure on yourself went wrong? What what happened for you to to gain that opinion of it? Um, it would be a few times when we'd be um, training, and I'd want to do everything. So you know, my 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 position was being a winger, um, and it, you know, back then it was, you know, how many crosses can you put in for the strikers to score? Um, how many times can you beat your man? You know, all of those kind of things. And then when you train with the first team, you, you know, looking at same midfielders who, you know, unbelievable technical technical and can receive and pass. And you start thinking, yeah, I want to do that as well. So in training, I start to try and do everything and, you know, it goes wrong. And I'm, you know, manager shouting at me, oh, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm just, but they don't want to hear that. They want to know that you want, they want you to do what you're best at. You know, the rest we can work on. Um, so, so again, I think those, those, those were the few defining moments for me that thought, okay, just, you know, put those to the side, obviously still kind of try and learn in your head, but make sure you're doing what, what, um, what made you get there in the first place. Um, you know, again, it would be, um, trying to cross it a certain way that I just can't do. Um, and, um, and then when it came to the games, then, you know, you, you try and implement way too much information in your brain and, and um and it's not coming out properly on the field. So just trying to simplify what you were doing that that managed to help you. Yeah, hundred percent simplify. I mean, I, I seen um when John Stones came uh, back playing with Man City and you know he's scoring those goals and I seen Michael Richards um who's, who's a good friend of mine. He was saying um how he just stripped everything back. You know, went back to being simple but effective. And and as a footballer, you you want to be able to have everything in your you know, in your toolbox, you want to, you know, zing the ball, you want to ping it here, you want to do this, you want to volley, you want to, but not everybody can do, you know, that some, a lot of people are good at that and, and, and the rest of others. Um, so yeah, literally it was just, you know, stripping it back. Um, and I knew I had the pace. Um, so that was, that was what I was, I was headed for. And that's what I used um, to, to obviously try and propel me to the next level. So using some of these guys, obviously, that, that you played with it during that period of time as an example, um, we spoke about a little bit before. Um, these guys, are, and you know, I've talked about Walcott and, and Gareth Bale. Gareth Bale in particular is, is, you know, is one of the world's finest ever footballers. Mm. Could you see during that time that he was going to emerge as, as that? And, and what sort of stuff was he doing to allow himself, do you reckon, to, to reach the levels that he has done? Yeah, now I say this is a story I like to tell people because especially with the younger boys now, um, I want them to understand that, you know, you, you, your development comes at such a different time. You know, um, Theo, for instance, didn't start playing football until he was about 12, I think, you know, for Southampton, 12 or 14. Um, and then you had Gareth Bell, always had a great left foot, but physically, you know, he was he was tall, you know, he was he was a bit gangly. Um, you know, he didn't have, he hadn't grown into his body as such. And um, I was, I'm a year older than him. So when he was coming into his, um, to live at the lodge as a, as a YTS, they, they said to him, you know, we're, we're going to keep you um, for the year on trial kind of thing and see, you know, how you developed. And obviously he just kicked off from them. But, you know, it's always hard for, for 
I think for coaches or anyone to see, yeah, he's going to be, you know, the best or he's going to be this because everybody develops at their own rate, you know, um, some quicker than others. You know, we had um, a kiddie that I think from the age of was it 12 or 14, um, they tried to tie him down, you know, to, to, to a contract. And by the time it got to that stage to go and, you know, be a, be a professional uh, YTS, um, everybody had gone past him, you know, so he ended up, you know, not, playing for Southampton um so you know you, like I say you all develop at different times and and Gareth was yeah one of those ones and next thing you know he just grew into his body he got powerful he was always fit but never had that pace that you, you see now you know um and then from then on it was just um yeah superstar in the making I'm going to move on from those sort of youth team days mate if I can and and after establishing yourself in the first team for for you know for a long period of time um, in July 2008, you, you sort of had a challenging time with, with a bit of a contract dispute um, and something that I've read about and it's something that I wanted to touch on a little bit just because supporters and fans and players don't really get access to, to something happening like that. Mm. Um, and obviously that you were playing at such a high level at the time mm. um, and were sort of not included in any pre-season friendlies. Mm. Um, I think... Uh, there was something else that you were excluded from, you know, from the first team in, in the public or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I really want to know or just get in, an insight into what that feels like mm -hmm. um, for a player because these are the sort of stuff that, that people don't really see. Was that at Southampton? At Southampton yeah, yeah, so that was, again, you know, when you're, when you're younger, you know, you turn it into a man, everything's going on, you know, you've got your football but obviously you still got, you know, a bit of social life and, you know, being in, in college, you, you make friends with um, other people. And when you go out and about, you just want to have fun, you know, um, and then you drink comes into it, alcohol and all the rest of it, party. And, um, and nobody's there to, to not rein you in, but to just make sure that, you know, you're not going off the wrong path kind of thing. And um, I think it was, it was, I had an injury um, that I was coming back from and I think I still should have been in the boot, but, you know, I put my shoes on because somebody said, oh, you're coming down, Kano's, you know, down, um, and he was in Portsmouth. So I ended up going down there, um, you know, having a good time and whatnot. And, um, and after the show had finished, um, I think a, a few of these guys who I'd, I have no idea who they were, you know, they started... Um, in, they started taking things from this room and by guilty by association I was there you know so I was by the door obviously Bradley Wright Phillips was there as well <clears throat> and then um, you know I think the next day Nigel Pearson was my manager at the time and just called me and said I need to come in spoke to me and said you know um, you know showed me and told me what was happening um, but all in all when you know when you see when you obviously no one can see the footage back but when you see it you know you see what's happening and but that didn't matter because I was a footballer and so it was Bradley we were the only two that they they cared about they didn't care about anyone else you know um, and it was such a dark time for me you know and my family my mum and dad you know because I felt like I let them down um, and um, I eventually moved away moved back home for a little bit and used to travel down to train while all of that was going on um, um, so yeah, it was it was it was really it was really hard hard situation um, that I had to come through. You know, I had um, you know people you know sending me death threats. Um, I had people you know hating me and writing stuff about me. And then you you know you think about people back from back home. You know, all my fam family members or my friends. You know, oh, do they still do they think that that's me? Because it wasn't. You know, and again, I didn't do anything. But because I was guilty by association um, and I was there at the time, it, things were happening. Um, no one cared and once it's printed out there in the public that's all they see so um, eventually when I, I worked myself back into to play um, when I played at some some of the some of the grounds you know the abuse I got you know from the whole stadium you know chanting my name and and um, you gotta be tough you know you gotta be you gotta be strong um, mentally and you know I did find it tough I wouldn't ever look anybody in the eye when I was playing or going up to the um, to the games if I was on the bench and I was warming up you know, I just get so much abuse from the sides and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a test of character. Um, and luckily, you know, my mum and dad gave me the tools to, to make sure that I can overcome um, anything um, in my path, which I did. And I just made sure I relied on, on my, um, my ability and my love for the game and, 
I just put everything into into playing football, which, you know, um, looking back now was the best thing I could ever do. And, you know, it turned out well for me because, you know, I could have um, I could have turned to anything if, you know, if if that was the case, because I, I was borderline depressed then, you know. I mean, that's the sort of situation you're talking about. Obviously, what happened is incredibly unique and um, and it's something that other footballers might obviously struggle to, to relate to. But in terms of being in challenging times and obviously having to, to get themselves out of some sort of, um, you know, depression and football isn't spoken about a lot. But actually, when, when you know, when you ask people about their careers, a lot of people have struggled with, with you know, some sort of anxiety, some sort of depression, some sort of pressure uh, in football. What were the tools that, that you did use to, to help yourself get through that period? Um, I think it was just knowing that I had love from my, my family, my friends. Um, that was as long as they knew the real me uh, and my wife, um, Laura, who I'm obviously still with to this day. I just, you know, started seeing her. And, um, you know, I remember saying to her, look, you know, um, this is this is coming out. Um, I understand if, you know, you don't you don't want to see me anymore. And you know, she was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm. I know that's not you. I know what happened. You told me and I believe you. And and that kind of gave me that kind of, you know, chest out, fine, like I'm going to go and, you know, fight the world kind of thing. Because um, I knew that people knew what I was like and, and, and didn't take what the media and the public like to, to twist and, and, and put out there um, and believe. So that's what that's what kind of spurred me on. And, you know, I thought the only way I can, you know, shut shut the fans up is on the pitch. So it was, you know, going out there and, you know, doing what I do best and, and playing well and, and scoring some goals, which I did. Um, so, yeah, so that's... And so obviously, like an extension of that is, is supporters and I guess people in general's perceptions of footballers is is that everything is positive. Um, and for in 2009, it's sort of, I think you found it difficult to, for whatever reason to be in the team at Southampton um, and ended up alone at Sheffield United. Mm. Um, and again, obviously, just, you know, researching and, and looking into your career, that sort of was challenging for you to, to play loads of football. Mm. Um, but after this, obviously, you did join Swansea and, and things were incredibly successful for you off the back of that. Mm. I'm interested to really get an insight for other guys listening to, to them to be able to relate to when things don't necessarily go as well as they'd hoped at some clubs. Mm. How important is it to, to stay in the mentality that, you know, you are valuable mm. um, and that you can be successful? Yeah it's, yeah, it's a hard one. I mean, you just got to make sure that you see the end game. You can, you got to see that, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Um, so obviously when um, I wasn't really getting a chance at Southampton um, and that was when we had a, a Dutch manager and he he was playing all of the younger boys, but yet, I was kind of on the fringes. I don't know whether, you know, from up top, they kind of wanted me to go. Um, and, you know, luckily for me, I had a few interests. So my agent said, you know, Sheffield United, you know, he wants you, he wants to play you. So I was like, yeah, brilliant. You know, I'll go there um, and, and, and start enjoying it again. Obviously went up there um, and it didn't go to plan. I wasn't, it wasn't my style of play either at the time. Um, Sheffield United played, you know, a completely different way. Um, you had... Um, you know, like so Chris Morgan, James Beatty, and Gary Speed was still there at the time. So I played with him, lucky enough to play with him, great man. Um, and I remember see, speaking to my agent saying, look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing. I'm not, what am I doing here? And he's, you know, he just kept saying to me, trust me. He said, keep doing what you're doing. Show everybody, um, you know, what kind of person you are, what kind of, um, what kind of player you are, and things will come good. Trust me. He said, you know, um, that's, this is what you have to do. He said, you might not like it at this minute, but you know, persist with it, keep going, keep training well, keep putting everything into it. And I promise you that, you know, things will come out. So it was actually at the Liberty when we were playing um, Swansea, Sheffield United. And I, again, I wasn't in the team, I was in the stands. And uh, Martinez came up to me in the tunnel and said, look, you know, I'd love you to come here. I'd love you to, I think you'd fit in really well with this team. And I just watched the Swansea team absolutely pop the ball around. I was like, Whoa, yeah, amazing, you know. Um, and he was coming towards Christmas and I spoke to, to, to the manager at Sheffield at the time and, and said, look, I want to I go home and, and, and have Christmas with my family, um, have some time away. Because, you know, again, I was in a hotel for four months on my own, um, celebrating my birthday in a hotel room. Um, and, you know, it was a struggle for me, you know. Um, I mean, I made good friends, um, still speak to this day. I mean, Carl Norton, who's at Sheffield, you know, I first met him up there um, and, uh, you know, he kind of helped me settle in. So, 
So when it kind of came down to it and Martin, I said, you want to come here? And I said, yeah, 100 percent. Um, but then I ended up playing I think, the last couple of games at Sheffield and I scored and done well. And they said that they wanted to keep me. Um, but, you know, because I had a, a bit of a bad, um, not a bad time, but, you know, playing wise, I didn't have enough game time that I wanted to do. So, you know, I, I was promised game time here. So I came here and, you know, I, I started straight away and, you know, that was it. Then for me. So how important is it for guys, you know, all different levels, all different abilities to hold on to, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel that you're talking about? How can they do that? Like how, how can they approach, you know, training every day when they're maybe perceived as not being in a manager's plans? Um, it's, it's so hard because obviously you, you train all week. Um, you know, it's like you train all week to then get picked for the game on the weekend. And when you don't get picked, you know, you just go into kind of meltdown mode then you have to pick yourself back up and go again. And, you know, so many times that you can keep doing it until, you, you know, you kind of either stop trying or, you know, you start going the other way and start getting angry and, you know, and then things go wrong for you because you're not applying yourself properly. But, um, I mean, my advice is just to keep, is to keep, um, keep the faith, you know, just, just not understand and, and know that you have the ability to, to, to keep striving for, for, for the very best for yourself. Um, Obviously, everybody would always say, you know, just keep training hard, keep training well. But that's that's also hard, you know. But set yourself goals, at least, you know, in training. Say, all right, fine, then, you know, I'm going to, you know, work on this this training session. Tomorrow I'm going to work on this, you know, and just kind of tunnel tunnel vision into yourself and, and, and see what you want to improve on, what you want to do. Because, you know, you've tried it the other way. It's not actually happening. So keep doing that but also you know kind of have a have a battle with yourself as to speak on the pit on the on the training ground and um you know and, and and just go from there and we've touched on it a little bit about sort of youth football at the moment but there's such an enormous amount of players now at youth level and such a limited amount of spaces ultimately in first teams for them to to graduate to mm. um what advice would you give to these young players uh in that situation that's going to allow them to make themselves you know as attractive as they possibly can be to to the people who put them in those positions. My advice is to to try not to be the finished article, you know, because I think that's what ultimately you know everybody wants to do, and especially the younger boys. Again, it was different, you know, when I was coming through. You you had to go out and loan and earn your stripes, then come back. Now, people, you know, the younger boys are getting given a chance straight away. You know, they train well with the first team and it's like, oh, okay, cool. You know, you can come on the bench and then it's, you know, a few, few minutes here and there. Um, so, you know, we, we had to, um, back, back then, like I'm old, but <laughs> um, when I was coming through again, it was, it was, you know, go out on loan, you know, Harry Redknapp gave me my debut at 17. You know, I scored, got man on the match in the cup. I thought, yeah, brilliant. Next day he calls me and he said, you know, Nate, you know, I thought you'd done really well. I'm pleased with you, but I think you'll benefit on going out on loan. Um, and it was Burnley at the time. Uh, and you know, I was thinking, you know, why? You know, you just kind of seen what I could do. You know, I'm training with you all the time. Why are you sending me out on loan? I didn't understand it. You know, I didn't. It didn't register in my head. So um, again, you know, having you know people around me to say, you know, just go and do what you need to do, and you know, and they'll see what you can, you know, what you're capable of. So I did, um, and it was meant to be. You know, I think it was a three month loan, but I ended up playing four games, scored two goals, um, and then I got recalled back. Um, and then you know, I played for Southampton then. So you know, for me, it was, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have a manager, Steve Cottrell was at the time and, he, you know, he he loved me and kind of just kind of not centred things around me, but made sure that, you know, I was, you know, um, a lot of the vocal points, you know, because obviously dribbling and putting the ball in the box. You know. <laughs> Adi Akinbae, um, gifting the Williams, like a big guy. So I was just, you know, just whacking the ball in the box for them to score the goals. So, and again, it was what I was good at. So it was looking good on me and obviously, you know, they were enjoying it as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, watching, watching and seeing a lot of the young boys now, um, you know, and in the England team, you've got Jude Bellingham, who's obviously made a, you know, unbelievable move and rightly so, you know, he's a great player, but it's coming more apparent now that 15, 16, 17, it's like, well, I should be playing now, you know, and, and that's not always the case. Every, everybody's path is different. Um, so, you know, don't strive for, um, for, to be the best too soon, you know, just work on yourself and, and and things will evolve for it. so by this point after having signed for swansea permanently you'd, you'd obviously had you know highs and lows already in in, in your career mm. but the season after you signed there permanently 2010 11 um you're named the sports player of the year um and you're almost uh, and you're also promoted to the premier league via the playoffs um 
Swansea are the first Welsh team to do that. And obviously in that playoff final, you performed exceptionally well and, and, and you set two two goals up. Um, I think the game was 4-2, wasn't it, that you won? Yeah. Um, I want to know like, what experiences and what was it about you that allowed you to perform at such a high level in such a high-pressure game like the championship mm. playoff final? Um, I don't know. I was, it's hard. I mean, I think I always had that, that grit and determination from such a young age, you know. I mean, I was always quite small, quite small, I'm still small, but <laughs> I was always small. So, you know, I had to work that little bit extra against, you know, the bigger boys to, to make sure that I didn't get thrown around or bullied. So, you know, in every avenue, you know, um, any sports that I did, I did athletics and all the rest of it. And you know, I was always, you know, slight and small. So I had to make sure that I put extra um, on top of that. But I always had that inside, that, you know, great determination and, and that, you know, um, nobody can beat me kind of feeling um so and i think you know, my mum and dad made sure that you know i had that that tool in 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 the kit so you know it was um going to that that final it was unbelievable um we had a great team obviously unbelievable team and the way we played football you know it was it was insane and it was just again it was just going out there enjoyment i remember we used to play against um teams in the championship and i i knew a lot of the boys there and they'd um you know, they before the game they'd be like, "Oh, let's have a touch for you," you know. So I, you know, it was that was then gave me gave me a come on, then boys, let's show them, you know, what we got kind of thing. So you know, it was just you know, in and out popping. And I loved the way that you know Barcelona play, Spain play, or you know the Dutch the Dutch play the right way for me is you know you know pass and move and pass and move. Um, so I enjoyed it so much. And when we got that chance to go up, you know, in the playoff final, that's the first time probably I've ever been. You know, I felt sick, you know, I was so nervous going up, you know, the fans all on the on on the walls and, you know, you just couldn't even see the stadium at that point. And I just thought, wow, this is this is massive, you know, this you know, I didn't realise at the time. You just, you know, take each game as it comes and that's always been me. I never look like I never knew who I was playing three games in three games time. It was always, you know, focusing on the next one. Um so yeah, when it came, you know, it was it was a bit of a, a bit of a shock to the system. But again, as soon as I got on the pitch, it was you know, I believed in my team. I knew that we had um, a great team. We just finished third. Um, great manager Brendan Rodgers is one of the best for me, and um, and we just let it all let it all go out and, and, and let the football do the talking. I mean, a lot, like a lot of guys, you touched on it there, and I wanted to get more of an insight really into to that feeling of the day of the game. Mm. Like a lot of guys now are, are playing in often pressure games, youth football now that people are trying to have careers in football. Everybody's being judged all the time. Every single game is people are under pressure. Mm. And that one particular game is, you know, is is deemed in English football as being the most valuable game in the world, almost. Mm. So, what? How did you deal with that? You know, you've talked about not really feeling nerves before that uh, moment. Like, how did you feel in in the build up to the game? And what did you do? Uh, you know, in the changing room, how did you feel? What was going through your mind? Um, just making sure I prepared well. I mean, even from the night before, just making sure that I did the right things. Um, obviously, you know. You know, they say they tell you what to what to eat and what to drink and all the rest of it, but making sure that you know you're you can focus into yourself, channel into yourself, and kind of speak to yourself the night before. I mean, we we were lucky enough to to work with a few people at um, when I was that young uh, a youth team boy at Southampton that um, worked on envisioning what you're going to do on the pitch, kind of thing. You know, so it's you can see yourself on the pitch, you know, doing X, Y, Z. Um, so that's what I was doing the night before. And then on the day of the game, you know, when I'm in the changing rooms, um, I think it was just making sure that everyone was relaxed. You know, uh, when, you're, when you're too tense or the team's too tense, even the manager, if, they, if the manager's um, walk, pacing around, you know, you can see that. And, you know, you, you start to, it comes, you know, it comes on to you. So, you know, with Brendan, he was, he was a chilled guy. Um, and we had a lot of uh, great characters in the change rooms that, you know, we were doing two touch in the change rooms. You know, we were, we were ready for the game. Whether that some of the boys had inside them, you know, in their head kind of had that, like, flipping out, I got, I got to go, you know, I got to do this now, um, which I know I had. It portrayed to everyone that, you know, we were relaxed and everything was fine. We're going to, you know, just go and enjoy it. It's another game kind of thing. Um, but for me personally, um, yeah, just preparation, just making sure that I was hydrated, making sure that I had, you know, all of my stuff ready um, and I wasn't flapping around, you know, last minute to to get, get this and get chimpas and all the rest of it. So, um that 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 always helped me make sure that I went on the pitch then and 
And um, and as soon as the whistle goes, you know, I, I just zone into the game. You know, I was just fully into it. Forgot about the crowd. Forgot about everything else. Um, but the build up can also always um, make people crumble. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you you kind of even look at look at yourself on on clips, which I know a lot of people like to do. Um, and 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 know that you you know you you are the best and you can you can do it. So what I'm hearing really in the build up obviously to these big games is so long as you are held responsible for your own the things that you can control and and you prepare as well as you possibly can, mm-hmm. at least you put yourself in a position to to succeed. And if you sort of cut short of those corners, um, you're going to find it difficult, or or at least that's going to build to your anxiety. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. Just make sure that you do your job, and just you know, rely on, you know, your, your mate next to you doing his job and, and, and everything will be fine. Um, and I think that's when, that's when things do, do go wrong when you're not, um, fully switched on or focused on what you're doing. Um, again, like I like to listen to my music, um, before games, um, just again, zoning on myself, um, you know, kind of just chill out. And a lot of people have their different types of stuff they like to do. Um, and um, some are superstitious, but for me it was, um, you know, just challenging on making sure that I felt good, felt ready, you know, I felt loose and I felt um, I felt ready to go. So obviously you won that game um, and, you, you know, you're involved now in, in obviously Swansea City being Wales' first ever Premier League club. Um, people always talk about how much of a step up the Premier League is from the Championship. Um, but, you know, not only did Swansea manage to have a really f- successful first season, um, you personally did as well, and you played in almost every game that season. Um, what allowed you to make that transition from the Championship to the Premier League so well? Um, me personally, I always believed in myself, um, and I always knew that you know I can I can play against play at the top level. Um, a few times we played in the Championship, we played against Premiership sides in the um, in the cups and. I know the cups are different, you know, um, but when you play against those 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 top players, you know, you kind of think, well, you know, I kind of held my own here, and you start to believe in yourself that you can do it. So when you, you know, when we did go up, you had no choice at the end of the day; you had to kind of sink or swim. So, um, uh, but we had a good team still, you know, we had the, we had the same boys um, that were together, added with a few few extras that came in, and. Um, but we maintained the style of play, the way we like to play, and that helped us massively, you know, keeping the ball, um, made us control a lot of, you know, our actions and a lot of the, the situations. Um, but yeah, it's a massive step, you know, not massive step to, to different things, you know, like tactical, tactically, um, it's different. I mean, you know, I remember playing against Chelsea, against Ashley Cole, and, you know, I switched off one minute, you know, I saw him, looked away, next minute, ball's, played in behind, he's through on goal, crossed it, and it's a goal, you know. So um, in those sort of things that, you know, are a lot different to the championship. Um, and I think it is a big jump. Um, although it's a league down, it is, it is a big jump. Hence why, you know, you're, you've done well if you do stay in the league, you know, the next year. Um, and we were lucky enough to stay in there for, I think it was seven, seven seasons or so. Um, and we held our own. And I think that was down to the way we played and, and, and our philosophy that we had at Swansea, which, um, again, you know, we tired players out, we tired teams out and um, it made it hard for them. Um, you know, we didn't just sit back like sitting ducks and let them run all over us. So, um, yeah, and it was, um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a tough first year. I remember playing against Man City, I think it was. Aguero just signed and he just come on and just did a madness and just banged it and thought, wow, OK, there we are then. That's why, that's why he's the best. <laughs> Go have a shower, mate. <laughs> And see, uh, for you specifically, what were the overriding differences from, you know, from championship level to, to Premier League level? And how did you prepare for that? What changed in your football lifestyle? Um, nothing, actually. Yeah, nothing, nothing really changed in my lifestyle um, as such. I think, you know, you just, I just carried on and I just played, still just played the same way. I think I was developing a lot, a lot more. I was, I was understanding the game and what to do and what not to do at certain times in the game, you know, like game management. And again, those are those kind of things only come with experience. And obviously, you've got to play games to do that. And I was fortunate enough to play a lot of games in the championship and then, you know, in the team, you know, for a long, long time in the premiership, um, developed a good relationship with Angel Rangel, who's um, right back. And, you know, we just knew each other inside out. So, you know, covering and, you know, when the ball came to him, he knew where I was going to be. So that helped massively. Um, and um, and it just flourished really. Um, so yeah, that no, was it was it was a good time. So would you say that you learned 
on the job, you know, whilst you gained that experience from playing or was there anything you were doing outside of the match day that was allowing you to obviously perform when you were, when you were playing? Um, I, again, it, a lot of the time it came down to, to a lot of coaches, a lot of coaching staff and, and, and managers that did help me, you know, they did speak to me and talk to me um, and, and kind of tweaked a few things in my game. Um, you know, I was always that person that as soon as I got the ball, I thought I could beat, you know, 10 people. Um, and, and them pulling me aside and making sure that they worked on, you know, X, Y, Z, which I did do, you know, I stayed behind. I was, ended up working on, you know, um, my crosses and making sure I was working on, you know, every day, just understanding the game and, and learning. And I think what you have to do is, is also watch watch games, watch you know, other people, watch other people train or other, other, you know, other teams play on, on the TV and, and see how they do things as well. And then implement it into your game. Like you say, in training, you know, you say today I'm going to set myself a goal of I'm going to try not to lose the ball or five times is the most amount of times. Or, you know, I'm going to play, um, I'm going to try and use my left foot as much as I can or, you know, right foot if you're left foot. So um you, you always have to set yourself goals which i always did for myself um and i felt that helped me improve um as well um and again me being small i worked on a lot of um a lot of things in the gym not necessarily big weights but you know things specific to my position to make sure that i had that that power and that explosiveness to to um to to maintain that level at the, uh, in the premier league i wonder if you could let us know a little bit more about this goal setting that you talked about is that something that you always did no, I didn't, and um, you know, it's, I gotta thank you know the obviously the late Saul Regis, who was my mentor from the age of fourteen. You know, he he would always speak to me um, before games, um, and he'd always set goals for me to set myself. You know, it's like right, you know, you know, what did you do last game? Okay, this game, this is what we're gonna do. You know, so you know, right, make sure that you get um, a minimum of eight crosses, or you know, you, you do this, and then the rest is you know. Um, just work hard. I mean, he always, there was one key thing that he used to say to me was, if things aren't going right, just go and put yourself about, you know, if things aren't going right for you on the ball, then make sure that you, you, you are shown to be working and putting yourself about, um, because more times than not, that can, you know, overshadow when you're, you know, on, on, on form. And, um, people appreciate that as well. You know, fans appreciate that you, you know, you're working, working your socks off and, um, and, um, and getting stuck in and, and involved, um, and not thinking, no, oh, it's not working. So I'm just gonna, you know, throw my arms about and and sulk on the pitch. So um, yeah, I, I got that from Cyril. Cyril kind of implemented that me in in my head, um, and that's what I um, I carried forwards. And what like what was it about goal setting that that obviously had a positive impact on you? How did you feel a benefit off the back of doing it? Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, without noticing, you know, when you do play the games, you know, you're doing things that um you know, that are just becoming naturally now you know so i'm knowing you know when i'm in certain positions or in a certain moment what i need to do because i've been working and training my brain for it every every time so um you know and i'm not i was never the best at um doing extras and i was <laughs> always you know i think if i did apply myself a bit more maybe you know um i could have you know improved even even better but um at times i was lazy um which i look back now and i wish i i did extras you know i looked at i look at you always talk about and, and hear some of the greats and they stay after hours and hours practicing and you can see why because when it comes to that that point on the game you know they can they, they can deliver you know i mean watching gilfy sigurdsson when he was at swansea as soon as training finished he'd go and grab two bags of balls he'd go on his own if he didn't have a keeper just keep putting it in the same spot and obviously everybody knows in the Premier League that you know he's a set piece um, specialist um, even outside of the box he can put the ball exactly where he wants to um, so I wish I, I did apply myself a bit more than, than that but you know um, the little bits I did do did help me um, you know again improve and, and learn, learn, learn different aspects of the game Do you think that for modern day football um, you know the, the environment that we're in now that doing extras is important after training or or can obviously can guys get away with with doing without yeah i mean some guys do get away with doing without and you know they're, they're, they're i would say they're the lucky ones but um i mean ronaldo does does, does nine thousand times extra afterwards and you know he's at the top of the top of the tree so you know it doesn't matter whether you have the talent or not um 
if you're not willing to apply yourself and, and improve, then you will, you know, eventually you will go downhill. You know, you can never, football is, you're either up there or, you know, you're down there. There's no really in between where you just kind of chug along. Uh, there's very few that have that. Um, so, you know, for, 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 for guys that obviously feel that, you know, doing extras is, is all that they have to do. That's also not the truth because you can you can over um, work yourself. You can you can you know sometimes the brain is is is, is a powerful thing and overthinking things, um, wanting to do X Y and Z. You know you, you know you just have to strip it back again, like I said, and, and make sure you just do little bits at a time, little bits at a time, and um, eventually you know it all comes together. And Sigerson, obviously, as you've touched on, is has gone on to play, you know, at the very top level and, mm. and is exceptionally gifted at, at dead ball striking and is well known for his sort of long range shooting and stuff like that. He was doing that daily, was he? Mm. Daily, daily, literally. You know, he, it wasn't a day that he wouldn't. And he'd get angry if he couldn't shoot. You know, if the manager says, no, 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 shoot, he'd get angry and he'd be like, you know, oh, what, so you want me to, you want me to do this on a Saturday, but you can't let me, you know, and he had that, you know, it's like he was focused, tunnel visioned, you know. And I watched um, Tiger Woods documentary the other day and, you know, seeing how he, um, obviously it's a bit different, but seeing how he got himself into a, into a, into a, a situation where all he could focus on was himself and what he was going to do was, was incredible. Um, and again, I wish I had that a lot more, um, um, but I like to, uh, to enjoy and laugh a bit more. And, you know, I didn't take things as serious as I could have. Obviously, modern day football is now, uh, you know, as, as you well know, sports science is, is a pretty big deal and, mm. and a big part of that. Someone I've spoken to recently, um, he won't mind me talking about it, Matt Ritchie talks about how he loves staying out after training. He loves, you know, practicing where he feels like he needs to work on. But now sports science mm. is, is working in a way that they're, they're asking him, oh, you've done 5K today, so you've got to come in or, or you've done too much, you've got to come in. How can guys obviously want to improve, mm. but want to stay in a in a position where they're ready to play on a match day mm. get the balance right between the two how is, it, how is that possible in your opinion it, it's tough it's tough obviously you know Marit, she touched on it and he's probably in the era that i was in where you know um used to probably just get told like how you feeling boys and it's like oh, yeah, i'm a bit leggy today so like, all right we'll have a down day kind of thing now you know you've got numbers always and i i don't understand it myself you know it's it's i i you know i get it but you know you telling me that I've um, I've only done this and that doesn't mean that I'm not feeling feeling it in my body. You know, I might be struggling, but I've only done you know a certain amount of numbers, um, running wise or um, physicality. So sometimes you know, generally just asking pl players how you're feeling or what would you want to do um, is is essential as well because um, you know I think stats is coming into the game massively now, um, and I mean. A lot of people think if your stats look good, then, you know, you're on top of the tree. But we've signed players before that have had great stats. And when it came down to actually, you know, playing, you know, they they weren't what was expected. But the stats at the time looked good, um, which can also give a false reading of situations. Um, but, you know, it's, at the end of the day, the, the managers and the coaches are your boss. So if you can't do any of that, then I know a lot of players that go home um, do a bit extra at home or go somewhere and, and do what they, they feel that they need to do um, rather than um, having to stay out on the training pitch. So moving on a little bit, in the space of two years, you've gone from playing in the Championship to playing regularly in the Premier League and in the Europa League now as well as you guys qualify for the Europa League pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the season of 2013-14, um, you know, you were playing in both competitions uh, and we hear the managers, you know, at the top level these days always talking about, uh, you know, a fixture pile up and, um, and too many games in a short amount of time and guys not being able to replicate, you know, their level mm. um, as often as possible. Um, that season you were able to find a way of performing to a high level consistently. Mm. How did you manage to do that? What was the, you know, in between each game? What did that look like? Was that when we were in the Europa League? Yeah. I think it was... Um, just excitement for us and, and just it, it was different you know so in none of I don't know if, I don't think any of us had played in, in the Europa League before so that was just a new experience for us and we were just you know going to these different places and you know playing at um, you know the Messiah and, and all of them, them places there it was just like wow you know we kind of thought yeah this is a dream come true kind of thing you know travelling around because you know we're little old Swansea at the time you know yeah we'd done well we were progressing and making those steps but yeah, this is a different different ball game, you know. Um, so I think we just went off of adrenaline, really. Um, and again, we believed in what we were doing. Um, Playing-wise, we had some great technicians, you know, great players. 
um, a lot of foreign boys that, that kind of help balance that out as well. Um, and um, yeah, we just went out there and enjoyed the time because, you know, again, winning the League Cup was um, a big you know, moment in Swansea history. And um, and and being in Europa League was was another one. So you know we just wanted to make sure that we just enjoyed it while it lasts. And that period of time in between, obviously playing on a Thursday, playing on a weekend, playing on a Thursday, playing on a weekend. A lot of guys playing at the moment due to obviously recent events. The schedules of football are you know are relentless. Guys are having to recover really quickly. Mm. What specifically did that look like for you? Like what sort of stuff were you doing, and what was important for you to be able to? get from one game to another? I think it was, um, um, a lot of the time it was just recovery. I mean, you know, we were lucky enough to have, um, you know, Laudrup, um, who made us, he just made us kind of understand that we had to look after ourselves, look at and know our bodies. Um, and he, um, he played before, so he knew what it, what it, what it meant. Um, I think it all comes down to how teams play, how players play. Obviously, if you're, you know, a guy that's, you know, put in very high numbers running up and down, then obviously naturally it's going to be tough for you. But um, obviously the nutrition then does come into place and it's making sure that you're eating well, you know, sleeping and, and drinking well, which I do feel does help you. Um, I'm not um, I'm not with it 100%, um, but yeah, I do think that that, that helps and um I mean, again, at the end of the day, you know, that, that's, that's your job at the end of the day. You know, you've got, you got to go out there and you've got to do what you need to do. Um, whether you need to come off because you can't go any further, you go out there and you have to give it your all. Um, that's, that's the be all and end all, really. So recovery at the top level, um, what does that look like? And can guys who are not playing at that level relate to that? Can they emulate what that looks like? Yeah, I think they can. Um, like I said to you, I think it, a lot of the time, you know, it looks more complicated than it is. Um, I know we've got a few... Um, sports scientists that uh, you know like to give it the uh, the big one and say you got to do this and that, but and they are right most of the time. You know there are things that will help you, um, but I think that individually you can find what works for you. You know some some things that work for me doesn't you know might not work for somebody else. Ice baths, for instance, and that kind of recovery um, helps other people. For me, it's just making sure that I sit down and rest my legs. You know, and I'm not running about, walking about. Um, having a massage or, or whatever helps players sometimes you know it's it's not the case case for me so I think it's finding that little little thing that works for you um, and sometimes it's a placebo effect in your brain that you know you think oh I've done that now you know I feel a million a million dollars where you know you're still actually the same but you know it's it's in your head that you feel good so therefore you know you're going to go on and, and perform. You guys had, had obviously played in the championship played in the Premier League and, and in a short space of time had gone from you know, experienced in different styles of play. You'd gone from being the team that everybody expected to win to being the team that possibly people didn't expect to win games. Mm. Um, what was it like in, in Europe and obviously expo- experiencing new styles of play and, and travelling obviously to different leagues and, and experiencing those sort of football games? Um, it, was, it was amazing, to be honest with you, because again, you know, you're playing against teams that have a different way of playing, you know, their whole setup is different. I mean, we had when we had a few Spanish boys come over, um, they were doing things that, um, you know, we were looking at like, what are you doing that for? You know, um, having siestas and, and then not going to bed till like one o'clock at night. And, you know, I remember the, the coaches and that, uh, they weren't happy with them doing that, but that was implemented from them. For, you know, that was their, you know, um, their way from when they were such a young, young kid. Um, but playing against other teams, you get to, you know, again, if you if you want to hone in and watch what they do and, and how they do things, you know, it's a small little details that that they do do that you can um, you can pick up on, you know, and it's um, playing against teams that are amazing tactically, um, attacking defensively, um, you know, know how to again like keep the ball, for instance, you know, I think Spain are that you know unbelievable at the way they do that. Um, so seeing you know, that culture um, helped a lot of us that were in the team at the time put that into their game, which helped me, you know. So, yeah, what did you take from those games? Um, just things that, you know, you didn't have to be 100 miles an hour. Like, that was always me, you know. I was always, because I had pace, it was like, get the ball and go, you know. And um, knowing when you can kind of just turn the volume down and then back up again was was, was a big thing for me. 
Um, and that became a, a big part in the way I play, you know, um, slowing it down, sucking people in, making sure that then, you know, it's a burst and I'm, and I'm, and I'm through. That was um, a skill of mine, you know, kind of a one, two and behind. Um, and again, learning that it wasn't always I had to beat somebody, you know, and, and doing selfish runs that opened up play, you know, it's all, it's all again, it's all small details that you get to um, implement into your game. Um, and that's if you obviously care to listen and learn. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed that. How important is it, just going to touch on that a little bit more, that young guys, um, you know, hopefully people who can relate to you, um, are getting to a point where they're now sort of trying to absorb information, they're trying to take things in, they're trying to, you know, I'm not the finished article, I don't know everything, mm. um, and I'm going to continue to learn to, to be the best possible version of myself I can be. How important is that? It is very important. And I think that there's too many distractions around now, you know, the social media, um, you've got YouTube and, and everybody can log on and, and, and find videos of somebody doing this and that's what they want to do, you know. But the best thing is to, is to listen to your coach, you know. Um, whether you believe in what he's doing or not, he's bringing something different to the table. And obviously he's got that position for a reason and um, he, he knows what he's talking about. Um, so, yeah, make, making sure that you don't go off on a whim and just try and do everything at once and just take into to account of um of the professionals that can that can help you and ask for advice you ask for help you know um not always think feel that you have to take it up on yourself to to do this because it might be wrong what you're doing you know or or could be right um in my opinion nothing's right or wrong um and you just have to try and merge everything together so i want to get in you know and spend a bit of time on arguably the most successful part of your career um but may not have been perceived that way obviously when it first came about i just want to you know talk about in 2015 when you joined leicester on loan um how did that come about for you and you know what were your first impressions both of the team when you arrived and what your perception of your own ambition was by being there um it was a tough one it was a tough one to take for me personally um i mean again you know things that were happening off the field um that people didn't know about um did play a part into a lot of those things um I just moved house in Swansea to another house. Um, uh, wife was pregnant with a second child, um, and uh, and I just thought, you know, going off of the back of last season, that I was doing well. I thought, you know, I was gonna be involved at least with the team. Uh, Gary Mack was the manager at the time, um, and when they came back, it was um, obviously always competition for places. You know, I'd put everything into to, to pre-season, um, and then I got left out of the squad against and gives Chelsea away, and. That was when, you know, I thought, well, you know, hold on, what's, what's, what's going on with me then? Um, and then we had that conversation where I basically got told that, you know, um, I was no longer needed for the club and I can go and, you know, find somewhere elsewhere. So um, I think off of the back of my success again with, you know, um, the League Cup and, you know, scoring in the final and man of the match, I think I had a lot of interest. So there was a few teams that had come up to the Premiership and um, a few other teams that um, wanted me to go on loan. And I said to my agent, you know, I just want to go and play. You know, if they doesn't want me there, that's fine. I'll go and play somewhere. So um, I think it was, I had a lot of offers and I was on an hour in and then Leicester came in, deadline day it was. Um, I just finished training um, at Swansea and uh, my agent called me and said, you know, Leicester, fancy it. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, okay. And he's like, right, I need to get out there now. And I was thinking, oh, that's, how am I going to get out there? It's like a four hour drive or something. Um so he said, I'll call you back. And then in the end, um, you know, the late chairman of Leicester, um, he sent a, the helicopter for me to come down. And, and I thought, oh, what's going on here then? I'm feeling like somebody here. So I go up there and um, and um, touch down. And, and I ended up signing for, for Leicester, who at the time were, were, were doing really well in the league, um, which kind of played a part of me going there. You know, I wanted to, to go to a team that were, were doing well. In a sense, I wanted to prove that you know i wasn't um a piece of piece of rubbish which i felt at the time you know i felt like oh yeah yeah off you go kind of thing so um yeah i went to leicester and um and it all went went okay for me we often hear about players moving from club to club for positive reasons you know people are trying to sign people because they're you know they're in their good moment or it's a good transfer or whatever but as you're talking about you know often players are moving because of different reasons or for one or another at the club and and for whatever reason it hasn't gone well and they need to move to to play mm. 
if you are in a position where you are moving club um, for the perception of a negative um, instead of a positive, mm. how can people deal with that? Um, being in that position to, to get the best out of themselves like you managed to do. Yeah, you just got you got to um, hold that fire in your belly. You got to hold that passion and that drive because, you know, you're basically being told that you're not needed. So then it's up to you then to go and prove them wrong and prove them that I am a good, you know, I deserve to be here kind of thing, you know. And that's what I did. I felt, well, fine, then I'm going to go and, um, and do what I need to do. Um, you know, and, and it was, it's hard to take when, you know, you... you you feel like you get forgotten about, especially off of the back of doing so well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. Um, but everybody moves around all the time and, and you've just got to do what's best for yourself. Again, you know, self-belief is such a massive thing in football. Um, if you don't believe in yourself, then, you know, I don't, it's not going to come out and it's not going to happen for you. Um, so that's the, it's the main objective and that's what I've done. I went to, uh, to Leicester and... Um, fortunate for me, I made great friends, um, and it was a, again, it was a great family environment. Literally, like I left Swansea and, and went to another, you know, family, and everybody was together. It was a good laugh and you know, joke, and um, and we just enjoyed doing what we did. So, see, start that Premier League year. Obviously, I've been reading up on it more recently, just just in in preparation for to, to talk to you. Leicester were tipped for relegation, really, the start of that season. And obviously, as you've mentioned, they started off pretty well. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if people at that time thought they were going to be able to sustain that. But when you arrived, obviously, mm. in training and, and around the club, you're talking about being, a, you know, feeling like a family. What was it that Leicester were doing, specifically football-wise and training-wise, that you think allowed them to, to pick up so many results so early on? Um, I think a lot of the players had a, had a point to prove, obviously, off of the back of, you know, um, having a few struggles and there was a few players that needed to to show that they were um, capable um, and can play. You know, Jamie Vardy, Mares, you know, um, Kante, a lot of those players, you know, have come from, you know, the smaller teams in other leagues um, and, and they had something to, to, to prove. So I think everybody just wanted to go out there and, and give it their all. Everybody wanted to play. Um, it was... Um, it was a decent-sized squad, um, a player still coming back from injuries. So everybody wanted to play. So again, it was just, you know, in training, it was um, high-flying. Um, we had Craig Shakespeare, who was the assistant manager, um, amazing man. And um, he helped keep that kind of um, positivity around the place, you know, even from that, that bridge gap that sometimes you don't have with the coaching staff and the players, you know, we made sure that that was there. You know, we could, you know, we, we always had fun and it was no kind of standoff situations. Um, and I think that's what, that's what propelled, you know, Leicester to, uh, to, to go forward and, um, and do well. Um, like I said, we just went out on the pitch and just played, you know, there was no, there was no pressure. There was no, like, we need to win. It was just, you know, let's just go and enjoy it and see what happens. So, in tr I mean, were you guys like peak fitness? Was there a difference? Did you see any difference between, you know, Swansea and, and Leicester in terms of the day to day or on match days? Like what were the, the, you know, the overriding characteristics of that team? Do you think that during the start of the season, obviously we'll touch on the end, but during the start of the season that allowed them to, to flip the switch from being a, uh, these guys are going to get relegated to, to being like, these guys can be successful. Um, I think it was, it was making sure that all of the players work for each other again it was it was you know it was kind of like this the, an older sons of team that i was involved in um and uh you know everybody would you know do that go the extra mile for that, that 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 player that friend that they had on the pitch and you know there was no stone unturned um so you know a lot of the times it was it was just going out there and um making sure that we we done what we were good at as well you know all of this you know, passing and stuff wasn't um, at the forefront of Leicester at the time. It was, um, you know, quick hit on the counter attack um, and making sure that you um, you do things right. Everyone was solid defence. You know, they were so hard to beat, and and that's where we based it on. We based it off of just, you know, obviously Casper defence midfield and 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 at the top, um, and it just kind of fell together into a puzzle, really. When you talk about on a daily basis, leaving no stone unturned, what do you mean by that? Um, I think making sure that, you, I mean, everybody can see now, for instance, how Jamie Vardy is. And he's been like that from, from the moment, you know, I've met him. Um, and, it's, and it's, he was never a selfish person. You know, he'd always do everything for, for somebody else, you know. Um, 
and they'd always back you whenever needed. And I think that ran through the whole of the team then, you know. Um, you know, we had a great captain um, and and they always made sure that everyone felt part of the team. Um, so I think that, that was that was the main thing for, for Leicester was just to make sure that everybody felt, you know, tight-knit. And so people, players who were either tipped, uh, I'm going to get your thoughts on players who were tipped either individually or as a club, um, to fail in a season. So there's always perceptions of, oh, no, he's not going to be very good or they're going to get relegated. Mm. How can players involved in, you know, people being spoken about like that or involved in teams that are spoken about like that deal with that perception? Um, I think you've just got to use that to your advantage. If you're, if, like you, know, you see in, in a lot of sports, if you're the underdog, then there's no pressure on you. Is there? So, you know, you can just go out there and enjoy it and um, and do and do what your best I do your best and and most of the time it comes up well because I do find in football when you're when you haven't put yourself or the team under pressure you know you end up performing well when you're under pressure and it's a, a must win game most of the time that's when you do wrong it's the same as when you know you get given that one chance to go and, and play because you've been training well you know you want to do everything you know and, and most of the time when you do everything it goes wrong and you know you're wondering you know I did it i 110 percent in but into the wrong things you know um so uh yeah it's, it's again it comes down to you know mentality as well and and we we just um we just went out there and, and had fun you know we had players like Riyad um unbe unbelievable on the ball like one of the best i've ever seen you know the ball stuck to him like glue and you know you just saw him just loving just playing you know he came again a lot of these players came from um, the smaller leagues in different countries and so to have this opportunity you know they just took it with both hands and just wanted to prove a point and, and, and made sure they stayed there as well So see this perception of no pressure um, by Christmas you guys were flying so much that the, the hole in the Premier League you know it's like around Christmas top at Christmas is usually a perception of where teams are going to finish at the end of the season it's you know being top on Christmas Day is, is seen as a bit of a big deal in this country mm. um, did ever the pressure or like the perception of Leicester can win the Premier League here, did that pressure ever seep in to you guys or or was there a perception that, you know, that the mindset had changed because now you were seen as someone who could win the Premier League? Mm, yeah, I think maybe individually a lot of, a lot of the boys would have, um, would have thought about it. But as a team collectively, it wasn't until the early part of next year, the, you know, the following year that, say, February time, um, that it was kind of like, oh, you know, we, we can win this here, boys, you know, because again, we, we, even we were expecting, you know, it's, you know, we're going to have a, a bad patch at, at some point, um, you know, and, you know, we'd win and be like, one again, and again, and then it would just kind of snowboard and, um, and it never came really. Um, so that was when the belief then and the, and the mindset changed that, you know, everyone thought, well, we can do this now, you know, let's just make sure that we apply ourselves even more and um and uh, and go forwards because you know you never know what could happen and at, at the time as well some of the big teams were, were performing very badly which you know didn't take anything from what, what we were doing because we beat some of those teams but it did help a little bit um to 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 make sure that when we went into those games and we knew that you know we can beat these teams you know um obviously when you got man city or man united or whoever it was and they're firing on all cylinders. And you go into that game, you're just thinking, oh no, it's going to be a tough day today. But it wasn't like that for us. You know, we were going there thinking, come on, let's go and beat them. Let's go and shock the world kind of thing. And um, and everyone had that had that belief. Everyone had that fire. And, and, and that's what we've done. So I'm wondering if we can get like a bit of a backstage pass really into what a match day looked like for you guys from, yeah, from that period of February, you know, to the back end of the season. Mm -hmm. What was the approach on a match day? You know, what was being said in the changing room who was saying it? Um, what was the atmosphere like before a game? It was it was so relaxed. It was so we used to always meet up at the stadium um, together. We had a time yet to be in on. If you weren't there on the time, obviously you got fined. Had Riyad running in, trying to do up his his time. That you know, always late. I don't know how many fines he got, but he was always late. Um, but again, it wasn't anything serious. It was still with you know the fun aspects of fun, you know, banter side of things and. Ah, oh, you know, you're late again, uh, you know, laughing and joking. And it was, you know, you kind of went in, you know, we all had pretty much together. And then, you know, before we were waiting for the game, everyone was able to do, you know, what they want. And they had loads of different, um, we had a room that had, 
you know, different things that you could kind of go and do. Some of the boys sat down and watched the game. Some were um, playing pool or darts. Some were, you know, um, I don't know, on the phone. Some some stretching. So it was so many different things people were doing, but it was the things that helped them prepare for the game. Um, and everyone has different different things to do. Um, some people brought in series and watched their series on their iPads, you know. So um, just as any, and it was just a relaxed atmosphere. And I think Ranieri made sure that everyone remained relaxed. You know, whatever pressure was going on, he would never tell us about it. Obviously, sometimes you might read about things, but he'd never perceived that unto us. It was just, you know, dilly ding, dilly dong, as he said, and, you know, go out and have fun kind of uh, situation, and which what we did. And um, when you have leaders like Casper, um, Wes Morgan, uh, and even, you know, Jamie Vardy as well, you know, when when they're talking and um, to everybody, you know, it, it gets you up for the game and, and everyone was raring to go by that time. So, you know, even when things were going wrong at half time, we might be, you know, worked on something and it wasn't going right. And you know, we all got together in half time, said, boys, what are we doing? I said, stop any of this, Let's go out there and do what we normally do. And, you know, it was, it was a... It was an in-your-face, counter-attack kind of team. So, you know, that's what we've done. And, and it was a bit of a shock because nobody really do, was doing that in the Premier League. Everyone was trying to get the ball and pass and play him, you know, which was which was rightly so. Um, but we had that that kind of sucker punch, you know, and obviously with somebody as fast as Jamie Vardy up front, it was, um, I think, Robert Hoof one time cleared the ball. Like, it was a natural clearance. He smashed the ball down the pitch and it, Jamie was through on goal. But... And um and it was a goal and it was like just how you know but again it was the surprise element that we had um from Leicester which I think you know massively helped us um you know win some of those games and so how how did you guys deal with that success at the time how did you use so the perception of Leicester at the start of the season is that you know they'd like to stay up mm. once you surpass that feeling uh you know in that position in the table. How were you guys able to achieve success by winning so many games and continue to try and achieve more? What did, like, after the game, you've just, you know, you've won another game, as you said, we're all looking around and, and saying, oh, we've won another one. Mm. How did you manage to channel that feeling into trying to do it again? Um, I, I think it was a lot of things, you know, that a lot of players had things to prove to themselves, to other people, um, um, which obviously you know, spurred them on. But as a team, you know, we just wanted to to, to continue um, off of the back foot of what we'd just done. You know, I think that confidence is always high when you, you know, of course, when you're off of the back of a win. So, um, you know, we just we just kept it moving, really, um, and made sure that, you know, we, we, we were getting to a certain point because our bonuses was looking a lot better then. So everyone was like, hey, boys, you know, <laughs> Come on, if we win this, you know, we're here and this is this is what we can get, you know. And it, and it so, so some people it was life changing at the time, you know, because a lot of people, a lot of those those boys weren't on a lot of money, um, and coming from you know smaller teams that nobody have, nobody had heard of, um, it was life changing. So and we had a a, a, a massively generous um, chairman and, and 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 owners that um, made sure that you know if we if we did the do and we we worked hard and worked well and. and and got that success, then we would get rewarded. So that was also another kind of spurring moment for for everyone. Was um, you know we can we can change um, we can change our lives. So on the topic of dealing with success, really, you know, there's a pundits and media and and you know and the press started to I wouldn't say heap a lot of pressure, but there was pressure on Leicester in the end to to win the Premier League. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody was you know was being really positive about how the you guys were playing. Um, for other people to possibly relate to that feeling, you know, young guys who are now under pressure from parents or friends at school say, oh, he's going to make it like, oh, he's, he's brilliant. He's going to he's going to be a professional footballer. How can these guys d deal with that feeling of success? Like you're, you've got success, people being nice about you. Mm. How can you, you know, almost zone out from from people's perception and, and do what you've got to do? Yes, it's hard. It is tough. I mean, I've. For me personally, I've always been I know, a humble person. So, you know, I never ever saw myself as well as I should have maybe done. Um, and people always used to tell me that, you know, you know, you, you know, you, you're um, better than what you think or you've done better than what you think in your career. And, you know, I always kept it level. Well, that, was what, that was the way I was brought up. So, but then, you know, some players, um, it can, it can get them a little bit too excited. You know, like you said, you got, you know, friends and family that, 
you know, you don't want their, their ego to go too big because, um, you know, football is, is, is literally you fall off a cliff. So if, you, if you're not continuing to do what you're doing, you know, you, you can be at the bottom of the gutter very, very quickly. Um, and, uh, and that perception from media, from fans and players is, is, is hard and for a player, you know, and then you're, you're expecting to, to go and do, you know, everything. I mean, I've seen Harry Kane, you know, in, in, the, in the media today, and yesterday and whatnot, they're um, you know on his back, and you know you're kind of thinking, well, hold on a minute, it's, it's a team, you know, you can't, it's not just him. I mean, and he's strong enough to know that and how to deal with that because he's you know an experienced player now. But you just see in the pressures that do come with football, and you know when people, because people, we are every footballers, human beings, and I know the fans like to think that we're you know we're different or, you know, we should be doing, oh, you know, I used to get told, oh, what are you doing down here? You know, you, you know why? I didn't, I, I, I never had money before. I was never a footballer before. My family were, you know, normal people. Um, so to see that, you know, that that perception of, of people is, is different or play at football players is different. And obviously there is a stereotype, obviously, um, and people play into it, but um, the pressure um, is strong. And uh, I mean, there is no formula to tell you how to how to uh, make sure that you you, you figure it out. Um, you just have to find some way that that helps you. And see some of the guys that you you've mentioned talking about already um, in that season. You know, Kante and Mares of. I mean, Kante is obviously you know a shoe in for Ballon d'Or this year. Like he's incredibly gifted. Mares is you know as super talented as he, as you've t- talked about. Could you see that every day, obviously, in training and, and just in general by their personality, by their sort of professionalism? Were they, you know, were they top, top guys? Uh, and can you give us an insight into what it was, what it was like being around them? Yeah, it was um, it was funny because I kind of seen that transition because um, I had been told before that they were, the season before, you know, what they were doing, you know, in the, in the, in the Premier League winning season was, you know, 100 times better than what they did previous. Um, and they weren't sure what happened, but things just clicked, clicked. And like I said to you about people's progressions, you know, it could be at any age and, you know, you can just go from there to, to there very quickly. Um, who knows what it is or what people do, um, but it just happens. And, but yeah, you saw, you know, that, that Mares, you know, he's, he's just a joke on the pitch, you know, with the ball at his feet and you could see how happy he was when he had it, you know, he would always be trying tricks and flicks and two touch and you know he was just just wanted that football every single time you know and it was like it was his um and yeah he do it make people look stupid and people would be after him in training and then i think uh drinky tried to try to try to break him a few times but you know it was um it was um all in all it was it was a great time and you got kante um we had um, a midfielder called gokan inla who was who came with ranieri ranieri signed him and he was the holding um, defensive midfielder at the time, but um, he was a bit older, and I think that the pace was um, was quite high. And obviously, you know, he, he got caught on the ball a few times, and um, X, Y, and Z. But then, you know, when he came off, Kante went on, and when he went on, everyone was kind of thinking, "Who's this guy?" I don't know. Like, look at him. You know, he was everywhere. Um, and you think, oh, okay, fair enough. And then it was the next game. Then got put on again. And he did the same. I was thinking, wait a minute, you know, he's going to have to get given a chance here. But when I first arrived there, um, obviously I'd, I'd done well, scored, um, tried to be in the next, to start in line up the next match, but I'd, I'd injured my knee. So I was out for two weeks. Um, so when I was coming back and I was playing in some of the under 23s games, Kante was playing in those games. So it's the boys that weren't really playing in the first team would play in those games. And, um, Again, didn't hear any, didn't know anything about him. Um, so when he was given that opportunity in the, in the in the Premier League, you know, he took it with one hundred hands. You know, that was it. Him gone. Then you know, he was doing everything and anything he can. And you know, when he spoke to me, you know, he 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 said to me that you know, obviously, he's not just doing it for himself. He's doing it for a purpose. You know, he's doing it for his family. You know, he's got family to look after back home, um, which a lot of you know. Um, people don't ever see is what's going on behind the scenes you know you know how people are, are coming from struggles and they might be the one that you know can can help that situation within their family and he was one of those so um he got put on the map and he wanted to to make sure that you know his his family are taken care of first and foremost 
Um, and then for him to be successful. I mean, he's, like everyone said, he's the nicest guy in football. I mean, he used to foul you and say sorry and try and pick you up. And like, you, you won the ball, NG. Like, it's okay. You know, that's, that's what you're meant to do. And he's like, okay, sorry, sorry. And I, but I love him to bits. Um, I mean, I could go through all of the players. They were the same. Um, again, Jamie Vardy, you know, just out and out goal scorer. That's all he wanted to do was score goals. Um, smash it as hard as he could. And, um, and and he did that. So, yeah, I mean, watching watching those those players kind of peak and perform was 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 amazing to see and to see where they are now because they can Mara's you know I knew that he was gonna you know he was destined for something greater um, and I think he knew that as well but again he he always kept himself level headed you know um, he knew he was the best but he was never in your face with anything he was you know he's a nice humble humble guy as well and I, and I think that's what helped the team you know everybody was was generally the same nobody was you know above their stations and if they ever if they ever did you'd have you know you had big wes or whoever come in the hoofy and they'd take you straight down do you know what i mean so you know there was none of that going on and so see during your career you've managed to you know experience playing under some top managers um brendan rogers at swansea obviously now one of the country's most elite managers who you've spoken about already how redknapp gave you a debut louder you just talked about ranieri winning the premier league um what have been the biggest lessons? I know that's you know this is quite a large question considering the amount of guys that you've worked with. Mm. What have been the biggest lessons you've learned from any of these guys you've played under, um, and who had the most positive impact on you? Um, it do what you're good at. Do what you're good at. Um, don't overcomplicate anything. Um, they'd always, most managers would always say to me, you know, you know, just you, you're complicating it. Now, if you don't need to be doing things like that, you know do X, Y, and Z. And then when you're there, do what you're good at. Um, and that did help me because like I said to you, I always wanted to improve and I wanted to do everything. I wanted to become a midfielder. So I'm running all over the pitch trying to get the ball and, you know, I'm out of position and then things are going on. So learning, you know, that side of it, um, they always helped me with. Um, but most of those managers were just great man managers, you know, um, take away the tactics and, you know, the playing. They were great men, you know, just just nice to talk to. To make sure that you felt a part of the team and i think that's so important you know if you if if anybody is to become you know um the best or or, or what it is that a manager needs to make sure that everybody is together collectively and i mean brendan that was the first the first kind of taste i had of that um you know even the ask players that didn't really play you know they felt like they won and got promoted you know, and played all the time as well because he, he never left anyone out. He'd always make sure that you're okay and, and always ask questions that not a lot of people ask these days is, you know, how are you doing? How's your family? How's, you know, how's things at home? You know, is anything going on at home or, you know, outside of football? Um, it's too much is, is emphasised on, on what's doing on the pitch, um, which, you know, most of the nation see on a Saturday or whenever they play um, and don't know what's going on in and around them, you know, could be brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, no matter what it is, something could be happening. Most of the time it is because, you know, regular people. Um, but yeah, man management, they, they just were were um, always there for, for people and, and made sure that they got the best out of you. And then that is the way that they did it. You know, Harry Redknapp was the same, you know, he, he knew how to get the best out of players without, you know, having to do extras with them. He knew that, you know, if I do this, then I'll, you know, get the best whoever it was and all of those guys that you know are all completely different managers mm. um how would you say that you know what can players do to allow them to be attractive to different kind of managers how can guys adapt to different ways of working with different people um i mean you just in whatever they bring to the table you have to kind of um believe in and and and, and do and work on i mean sometimes managers come in and you're just not their cup of tea. Simple as that, you know. It, it could be down to as simple as, you know, um, they don't like the way you play or the way you do things. Um, and it's and it's that because every manager has, you know, a certain style and a certain look that they like. Um, and you might not be their cup of tea. So, it, you know, it's hard enough to, to, to accept that because you could have been the best last season or a couple of games before a new manager comes in and he's like, no, not for me. I want to do, do it this way. And then you're kind of thinking, well, hold on a minute. You know, I've just been... you. you you know, you see what I've just been doing, um, and that's hard to take for players. You know, and that's that's something that um, I've had to to learn myself. You know, I I've been told before. You know, you can you know it's nothing to do with you playing, but you know you need to go. Um, 
it's kind of like why but there's so many politics involved in football that um like i say until you start getting a bit older and learning and understanding the dynamics of it all is when you understand okay you know and then you kind of start to know I, a couple of times i'd knew on a wednesday that or a thursday that i wasn't playing on the weekend just by the demeanor and the way you were treated so um you know and you, you were able to kind of um not set yourself up for it but just um make sure it doesn't um hurt as much as, as, as it normally would uh listen mate it's been such a great opportunity for for me to speak to you um but my last little bit is what advice would you have for you know a 17 year old nathan dyer um just about to make his debut um just believe listen make sure you listen um obviously always wanting to improve um but all in all have fun enjoy it you know it's um like everyone always tells you it's a short career um so just uh enjoy every moment and um in every aspect that you can um, and never take things for granted thank you mate that's such pleasure. an incredible insight I, you know i really appreciate your time appreciate it been good thank you cheers